Do martial arts promote violence? I teach people the real use of real swords in real combat. Am I promoting violence? I'll tell you what I think, and then you can decide for yourself. Before we start, we have to define our terms. Words are important. They have meaning. They have denotations and connotations. That is literal meaning and emotional meaning. The selection and use of certain words isn't random. The emotional content of the word torture is very different from the emotional content of enhanced interrogation, even though they may describe exactly the same physical act. What exactly is violence? What does that mean? Let's explore that for a moment. The word violent is commonly used poetically or metaphorically to mean fierce or strong or forceful, like a violent thunderstorm. The ship was tossed on a violent sea. They made violent love. But we're not talking about metaphors. Many people, maybe the vast majority of people, have been convinced that force and violence mean the same thing that they are the same thing. That's a manipulation of language that would have made Orwell slap his forehead. A public relations coup second only to Gillette's 1915 campaign to double his market by convincing women to shave their legs and underarms. The story goes like this. If force is violence and violence is wrong, then one should be nonviolent, which means you must never use force. To be forceful, aggressive, or assertive in any way to any degree is to be violent. To be a good, nonviolent person, you must be non-forceful. That is, you must be passive. Now, to whose benefit is the passivity of the masses? That answer goes beyond the immediate scope of this discussion. But it's a question worth asking, and you won't like the answer. Suffice it to say that according to the Bureau of Extemporaneous Statistics, 100% of predators polled prefer their victims to be passive. But is it true? Does force equal violence? Are, are they the same thing? Is any and every use of force violence? Let me ask you a question. Suppose you have a, a rapist who uses a knife to threaten his intended victim with death or grave bodily injury unless she complies with his sexual demands. Now suppose the intended victim produces a pistol and shoots the rapist in the head. Do you think these two uses of force are morally equivalent acts? I would argue that they are not. Eric Fromm, in his book, The Anatomy of Human Destructiveness, distinguishes between two very different kinds of aggression, which he calls malignant aggression and benign aggression. Malignant aggression is the initiation of force or the threat of force against an innocent person for the purpose of coercion. And by coercion, I mean you compel them to do something that they have a right not to do, or you compel them not to do something that they have a right to do. Malignant aggression is the illegitimate use of force, the use of force to violate the legal or natural rights of an innocent person. When I say innocent person, I simply mean a person who was not themselves engaged in malignant aggression. Malignant aggression is violence. It is force that violates. Violence violates. That's pretty close to the Latin willare to treat with violence, outrage, or dishonor. Now, benign aggression is the use of force to protect or defend yourself or another innocent person against violence. It's a response 
to the imminent threat of violence. Benign aggression is self-defense. It uses the type and degree of force necessary to quell violence and not one calorie more. It is force used to protect, not to punish. Benign aggression is not violence because it does not violate anyone's legal or natural rights. The rapist in our example doesn't have a legal or natural right to rape his victim. His victim does have a legal and natural right to self-preservation. With this understanding of the difference between malignant aggression and benign aggression, let's consider how it applies in martial arts. Oh, but first I have to distinguish between two different kinds of martial arts. There are military martial arts and there are civilian martial arts. Now I grant you there may be some overlap here. Military martial arts are for soldiers, mostly men, to acquire the skills and knowledge used in war. Civilian martial arts are used by men, women, and even children to acquire the skills and knowledge used in self-defense and also to develop character. Fencing, by which I mean scientific swordsmanship, is primarily the civilian use of the sword in single combat, that is, the duel. Secondarily, we sometimes consider its use on the street in self-defense. A duel is a voluntary combat in which all parties consent to participate. It cannot, therefore, be considered malignant aggression. There's not an attacker and a defender. There are two attackers. One is not violating the rights of the other. They're both surrendering their rights. Therefore, a duel cannot be violence. A street fight, what we sometimes call a brawl, is a response to an assault. That is, it's a response to malignant aggression, usually a criminal act. That would make it self-defense and therefore not violence. On the other hand, do keep in mind that there are ways to violate a person's legal or natural rights without using physical force. However, we reserve the word violence for physical acts. Otherwise, we're back to vague and extremely elastic poetic metaphors of storms at sea. Let's make one other distinction the difference between real fighting and play fighting. In a real fight, the parties intend to inflict harm on each other any way they can. Injuring or killing the other party is the goal of the transaction. A real fight may be a case of violence versus self-defense, or it may be a mutually engaged combat. In play fighting, the parties intend to win a fighting contest within the constraints of agreed upon rules. Now, certainly injuries can occur in play fighting, but they are incidental to the goal of winning. They're not the goal in and of themselves. Despite its shortcomings, play fighting can be quite useful as a training vehicle for real fighting, um, if you keep it real. I've done a lot of different martial arts, not all of them, but a nice, you know, all-you-can-eat Chinese buffet. I know that there are good teachers and there are bad teachers. Some people teach to make a difference. Some people teach to make a buck. But I've never personally encountered one that advocated or intended that you should start a fight, be a bully, or use your skills to commit a crime or harm an innocent person. Now that would be malignant aggression. That would be violence. I've never heard that in the dojo or in the gym. But some people will misuse all kinds of things. You know, automobile manufacturers don't advocate or intend that you should drive drunk. Firearms manufacturers don't advocate or intend that you should commit murder. If you drive drunk, that's not the car dealer's fault, that's on you. If you commit murder, that's not the gun dealer's fault. That's on you. You're responsible for what you do, and no one else. I suppose one reason I chose the sword as my principal teaching vehicle 
Well, it's not in spite of the fact that it's no longer a weapon in common use, but because it's no longer a weapon in common use. That minimizes the probability that you'll ever misuse a sword for malignant aggression. I also chose the sword because I think it clearly and safely illustrates some universal principles of combat that apply to all kinds of conflict management outside the realm of physical confrontation. For example, understanding your opponent, maintaining your emotional equilibrium. Both of those skills are valuable in a wide variety of situations and can actually contribute to de-escalation rather than escalation to violence. Don't confuse martial arts movies with martial arts practice. It's not just that a lot of the techniques you see in the movies are circus stunts. It's that the comic book bad guys are non-humans who do evil just because they are evil. And there are no lasting physical, emotional, or spiritual consequences for the good guys. In real life, a real martial artist knows that Fighting is not a good first response. It's a bad last resort. It's a sad, ugly, soul-wrenching last resort, even when it's absolutely necessary. They don't show you that part in the movies. As I said in the beginning, I teach the real use of real swords in real combat. I teach not only technique, tactics, and strategy, but also about the physical, psychological, and moral ramifications of fighting. I believe that the more a person understands about real fighting, the less inclined they're going to be to do any, and not if they can possibly avoid it. You know, in medicine, you don't study a disease in order to promote it. You study a disease in order to eradicate it. In martial arts, we don't study violence in order to promote it. We study violence in order to eradicate it. I guess if I do my job really well, I'll work myself out of a job. That would be okay with me.